To control a population, David, if you really get down to it, you have to take away their ability to think, their ability to understand where they are. Hey, welcome to Return to Reason. My name is David Craig, and I'm excited to be interviewing a great guest today. After a multi-decade career with a Tulsa Police Department where he was a member of the SWAT team, Mark Sherwood felt led to pursue a different career path. He is now a trained naturopathic doctor who is affluent in age and stress management, functional medicine, GI health, and immunology, among other specialties. Along with his wife, Michelle, Dr. Mark motivates and inspires people around the world with his versatile wellness practice. Today, he and I will be discussing what the pandemic's toll on the physical body really was and how we all can strive for optimal health, no matter what the circumstances. Stay tuned. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. Well, Mark, I appreciate you joining us today on Return to Reason. I'm excited to chat with you. You've got a, a wide range of experience, it looks like, but really you've got an alley you've been running down about wellness and personal health and wellness, even from mental, emotional, but also physical. Hey, Mark, what drives you then? Because you're a guy that's pursuing health and it obviously seems like you have a life that you love and you're fulfilling a purpose in your life. What drives you to really help other people with what you guys are pursuing? Well, David, thanks for having me. First of all, I'm really honored to be here. I've been looking forward to this. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm really humbled to be with you today. Um, man, I want to make a difference. You know, we all are on this planet Earth for a reason. And I look at like this thing called life as a gift. And I look at today there's a reason we call it the present. You know, we get 1,440 yeah. minutes per day to uh, spend as we want to. And I want to do a good job. You know, I want to make a difference and I want to fulfill the potential I have. And if I can do that and then teach other people to do that too, it's, it's been a good experience. It's a good thing called life, you know. So, Mark, one of your books, uh, The Quest for Wellness, um, uh, obviously, it's a very, very great read as we, I've been kind of going through it the last couple of days. Tell us a bit about that and, and where that came from with you. Well, I realized as my last stages of police work was going, you know, yeah. in America, you know, the average age of death for a 20 year retired male police officer is 66 years of age. Oh, wow. And I wanted to figure out why. I mean, why were my friends that I loved and served with and you know, and saw things with, you know, the, the tragedy you see as a police officer is unspeakable. Yeah. But what was taking their lives when it wasn't the career? And so I went on this quest, using that word again, to figure it out. And I realized that life is more than just about physical. It's also emotional, spiritual, and even intellectual. So I, I went on a mission to sort of, in that book, put something in there for people to do every day to benefit yeah. those areas, even if it was just one thing. And if you can focus like that, you end up being really a holistic focus, if you will, David, yeah. and we get, we get better. We improve in life. So do you find in your experience in, in uh, you're talking about the average age of a police officer's dying would be 66. Was there more than just physical factors? Like when you go into the emotional and, 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 uh, the emotional side of it, the spiritual side, do you find that that contributed and led people down a path that affected the physical or how do those three work together? No question. Cause it's like, we understand physical maladies and illnesses. I mean, we all yeah. get that, but I learned that the majority of the physical manifestations of disease process were rooted in emotional and or spiritual brokenness. Huh. For example, and I'm just going to be very bold with my sure. statement examples here. When you look at the eyes of someone who's staring at you and they put a gun to your, their head and blow their brains out in front of you and you see that, yeah. you know, there is something that you just don't forget. And it, it sort of messes with your psyche and you realize emotionally that if you don't deal with those things appropriately, emotionally, you're not able to cope with things physically. And many of the yeah. police officers would turn to poor food, um, alcohol, right? And then yeah. from an intellectual standpoint, uh, when police officers are given medications as a first line therapy and never given a back door as a way to avoid those, what's the root cause of disease, for example, intellectually they suffer. And then yeah. from a spiritual standpoint, whether it's God or whether it's the essence of who you are inside, when, when you lose the ability to hear that, yeah. you know, like the old saying goes, I'm in a place I shouldn't be. And you hear that little voice inside of you that says, man, dude, you got to leave now. This ain't yeah. good. 
right? Yeah. When you lose the ability to hear that and you get blunted in that signal, you, you suffer as well. So these physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual uh, parts of life are, are they're interdependent and interconnected. You know, you mentioned earlier you've worn multiple hats in your career, and, and what part of my work I wear multiple hats. And, and one of the hats I wear, I often come across people that are suffering from addictions. They're yeah. suffering from alcohol, drugs, and there's different types of addictions. There's food addictions. There's you can even get into social media addictions and how, what that effect is having on people and, and even younger generations. But that's always for me. That's just a symptom of something deeper yeah. that they're dealing with. It's not the problem. It's it's obviously a problem in affecting their health. People who are dealing with stress or dealing with anxiety, emotional issues that are really deteriorating their body, whether they see it in the immediate or not, what are some tips or things that you would, and it's tough to get into like how, without being super specific, but what would you generally tell somebody, hey, if you're dealing with this, what can you do to start walking into the path of healing regarding emotions? Number one, I think goes without saying, you got to learn to forgive yourself. The majority of people that get into these physical and emotional addictions, they they hate themselves. They're living in shame and they just want it to go away. Yeah. I have observed and even experienced it's easier to forgive someone else for hurting you than it is for you to forgive you from hurting you. And so yeah. we see this this self shame. And even in our second book, which is called Fork Your Diet, great title, right? Um, we talk That's about good. the frauds. Um, F R A U D S. And this is where it, the, the answer to getting rid of addiction lies. Frauds is an acronym, fear, resentment, okay. anger, unforgiveness, disappointment, and shame. And when you lose the ability to know who you are and you begin to be defrauded, if you'll use that word, you don't know who you are. You hide who you are at this point. You forget who you were. And it becomes this whole different life that you live and you end up saying things like, I don't even know who I am or I don't know what I've become or why. And so when you get behind that in people's lives, and I spend a lot of time talking people through that process as we deal with the physical, emotional and spiritual aspects of a person, yeah. we can see them break free from that. And it's, it's, it's really a unique experience when you see someone return to really who they were for and sure. then they get a vision back that it really is I, I put into the bucket of hope. Yeah. And, and you know what? Along those lines, too, it, it's purpose really goes a long way, I think, for what drives people in terms of continuing to be healthy. A lot of times when you walk into these areas of and, and there's real situations that can really throw people for a loop 100 percent. I'm not we're not trying to take away from that. But a lot of times people lose the purpose or what's driving them or what are they working towards. And I find that when you can restore and help people realize they have a purpose, even if they don't think they have a purpose, they have a purpose for being here. That, is, that That's a great way. And you, you summarize that really well by, by using hope and other things. But you know what? Hey, I want to jump over to a little bit about you being a, a naturopath, a, a naturopathic doctor, because that is something I think, depending what circle you're in, in, I'm in Canada, you're in the U.S., is that can be, I think, highly misunderstood, to be honest. I, I know some people, I know personally that when I say, hey, I see a naturopath myself, is that they're like, what? They think I'm crazy. But then there's also a lot of groups where you realize, it's like, man, there is so much truth. <laughs> and and if you go back to where health kind of stems from, it's like, I almost, you guys are on the right path. So tell me about you after your career, becoming a naturopathic doctor versus a traditional doctor. Because the difference is, you could have taken either route, to be honest. So why that? Well, um, contrary to popular belief, I'm not a quack, you know, yeah. right? I'm not, a, I'm not a goofball, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? But I, I look at it like this. Um, as I was into my professional career and, you know, being on the SWAT team, I had to be in shape. And so I understood yeah. the principles of, of exercise. And then as I saw my brothers and sisters dying too early, as I described earlier, yeah, yeah. I began to understand that what was happening with what we deemed to be traditional medicine was not working, was not effective. Mm -hmm. And I'm not anti-medicine all the way. My wife, who I like to refer to as not my spare rib, but my prime rib, you know, <laughs> that's right she on. is a traditionally trained medical doctor. She's an osteopath, okay, but she's also a naturopath. And we work together yeah. right here at the Functional Medical Institute. And so we get the best of both worlds, but For we sure. understand the proper use of medicine is to use it when you have an acute situation that you have to 
deal with because yeah. your brain's going off the tracks. Yeah, yeah. But you figure out a way and develop a plan before you initiate that action to get the person off that medication, right? That's what mm -hmm. you do. That's the proper way. And so I have viewed what you just described as traditional medicine in quite a different way. I have viewed it as experimental or alternative medication. And here's okay. why. Because it's only been around in just over 100 years. Yeah. And they are, quote, still practicing, yeah. right? Let me try this on you. They call it a medical practice. And it really is, you know, because if you don't work, something doesn't work, you try this. And it's like medication um, hypothesis 101. But where I look at it, what my wife and I do is traditional. It has stood the test of time. It yeah. is first line therapy. We have thousands and thousands of years on our side. Where did we get these old ancient remedies and that we have in these intercontinental spaces? Where do they come from? Yeah. People learned how to adapt. They learned that there was medicine uh, from plants. They learned that there was health from the earth. They learned that our bodies weren't born with medication and or vaccine deficiencies. And so yeah. all this stuff became part of our think tank, you know? And so for me, it was an obvious um, selection to go that direction because it's instilling again, the foundational truths that have always been. Yeah. I uh, Thank you for clarifying that because I'm glad you went that direction because it kind of leads me into the, the, and you've talked a lot about this, about your fifth generation warfare and, and talking about how that really is, is in, I believe, at least in our, our medical institutions in North America. And really what you have is you have a lot of people who are trained to think a certain way in what you described as, as what you call traditional medicine, the stuff that's been around for thousands of mm -hmm. years versus experimental. And, but really, if you, if you look at a majority of the people is that their faith is in, is in what's been around for the last 100 years because of whatever machine is churning to help that way. And I'm not trying to throw out because it does a lot of good in different situations. But tell me a bit about fifth generation warfare and what you mean by that. Well, when we were growing up, I think the listeners and viewers would understand this. Um, you know, you understand this as a, as a former hockey player, man, when you guys have an issue on the ice, you take the gloves off and you fight. Yeah. You know, <laughs> first generation warfare was with your fist, you know, sure. or, or maybe even as we talk about militaristic terms, it was with a gun. Yeah. or is with bombs or yeah. even technology but today it's shifted it's shifted to control the mind and it's through all different modalities through your media through your cell device through the tv um through propaganda driven on the news it's it's driving a belief system that doesn't give you an alternative in other words you mentioned a key point there, David, about people depending on medications of first-line therapy in North America specifically in the U.S. It is clearly defined as being able to advertise on television straight to children. Yeah, that is just unheard of. I mean, you think why would we do that? Why wouldn't you advertise salads to children, or good food to children, or exercise? Because there's no money in that. Yeah, the profitization of this propaganda-driven fifth-generation warfare is clearly based upon monetary gain, where sickness. And the ability to prevent people from critically thinking becomes a, a device for clear profit, clear, yeah. predictable behavior to control a population. David, if you really get down to it, you have to take away their ability to think hmm. their ability to understand where they are. And I'll give you one more example of this as in my um, police time. Yeah. Sometimes we'd have a hostage situation that we'd have to go to where a gunman, for example, would be holding people hostages. And there might be times where the, the, the hostage began to sympathize with their captor mm -hmm. and actually began to side with their captor. And even though they were in captivity, they didn't realize they were in captivity. They lost their ability to think. Yeah. And so the ability to reasonably judge a situation, good, bad, or indifferent, is taken away mm -hmm. through this consistency of propaganda much like the nazi germany did way sure. back in in the war you know they would throw pamphlets down they've controlled the media yeah. it's happening in other communist countries it is coming this way and beginning to happen more so in north america not just the united states but canada when you limit 
the totality of the information, taking away people's informed consent, understanding that they desire they desire the full monty of information. Um, that's the design of fifth generational warfare, and so far, I must say it's been pretty effective. Sad to admit that. Well, that really was a whole inspiration of why this program started and what we're doing in Canada here with, with our television channels and stations is that called it Return to Reason for a, set, for, a, for a purpose, is that you have this, really it's a war on free think, um, it's a war on the mind. It, it, you know, Dr. Gad Saad, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he says he's been a part of two great wars in his life, the Lebanese Civil War when he was young, and he goes, and also the war on the mind. And, and you look at it, how you have... Um, a lot of different people who are free thinkers, who their jobs in theory should be to be challenging the status quo. And that's how democracy and how we've grown in great countries is by right. sharing of ideas. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but you work the ideas out. You disagree, you present your arguments. And, and, and now people who do that seem to be labeled as provocateurs or antagonists or, or they're almost outlawed and shamed in a sense. And, and so there is that war that is going on. And that's why we love having guys like you and other people on this program is because I, I'm not having you on because I necessarily agree with whoever's on this program. It's because yeah. it's an exchanging of ideas. It's here to talk and, and disagree, but also let ideas get out there because ideas should be able to stand on their own or not stand on their own if they're if they're good and progressing. So it's interesting what you brought up, the propaganda machine that has, we've seen throughout history. If you look throughout history, it's not like this is a brand new thing. This is something that's happened and, and it's even moved into Canada and the US in multiple different areas, but also the, the medical um, industry as well, because you know that money and power can drive a lot of things, even over the wellness of, of, of different human beings. So one thing that, um, you were just chatting about and I, I'm interested in is how how do you try to combat misinformation and disinformation because if we're honest there are people out there whose actual jobs is to spam with wrong information put wrong information on purpose out there just to create confusion how do you counter that how can people watching you today try to combat that and keep themselves at least on the path of of, of reason well I'll put my answer in context with this. You know, you mentioned a very cool, cool point that history and some of the greatest discoveries, greatest ideas in history were based upon sharing ideas yeah. that disagreed in principle. Sure. And it was learning. And that's even the development of science, as we know. Science is nothing more than a, a hypothesis put forward. And it's if it stands the test of time, it becomes true. If it doesn't stand the test of time, it's just another thing that was not true. Yeah, yeah, you know, the earth being flat around, as we say. But what I try to get people to do, David, is this. I tell them to seek out sources that have been reliable over the course of time. Hmm. The best source of information is human to human contact, physical conversation. You know, we miss that. Social yeah. media has been a blessing and a curse. You can hide behind social media and someone might not know who you are. Yeah. Right. So people that work with us around the world, not just in Oklahoma, but around the world, they learn about us by getting to know us and they share mm -hmm. information person to person to person. The word of mouth, communication and sharing of information is the most powerful of all kinds. And when you find a source of what you deem to be reasonable information, like yeah. the Return for Reason show, you know, things like this, sure. when you find that, you hang on to that and you share that message as bold as you can because the mainstream media does not want to do that. As long as we have a few people out there that are willing to communicate, as we're talking about today, mm -hmm. generating the breath of hope for people, we're going to be all right. Yeah, yeah. We're going to be all right. And so you you got to gravitate to these kind of um, places like this and begin to have some wisdom to know what is right, what is wrong, what is absurd, and what might be plausible. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. I, I think that generally our population is uh, smarter than people give them credit for, is that we have the ability to discern, and, and we got a lot of us have a gut feeling, like, ah, it doesn't seem right, like something seems yeah. off. You might not know specifically what it is, but 
trust your gut on things and, and, and keep looking for information and alternate sources as well. I, I think one of the mm -hmm. biggest problems, if you're only getting your information from one side to reaffirm maybe a bias that we might have, yeah. is uh, then, then it's easier for you to be deceived and to think only a certain way. And I, I, would, I would stress, and I think it's important for people just to at least know and understand what a different opinion is saying than what you might think, just so you can kind of have that contrast of ideas and you can still decide where you lie on whatever topic it might be. It's good to know the different sides because iron sharpens iron, but if everyone thinks and talks the exact same way, well, then there's probably we stop progressing as a society. So yeah, I like people around me that are going to question yeah. what I'm saying. I really do. I appreciate that. And every yeah. leader out here in our in our country and world need to understand this. Yeah. The greatest leadership we have is a leader that can learn to learn. They yeah. can learn to say I'm sorry. They can learn to say I was wrong, and they can learn to not take so much credit when they do make a good decision. <laughs> That's a good point. No, I, exactly. And, and you keep moving forward on that. Hey, I, I want to slightly just shift topics a bit because you mentioned earlier in the program about obesity being a massive yeah. problem in our in our society in Canada and the U.S. and our Western world, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to chat about when it comes to health for children and health for kids. Um, and if, if there's people watching that want to be able to set their kids up for a, a great life on, on the health front and all that, I know it's a very broad question, but tips for parents in terms of how they can help their kids and get on the right path. All right, parents understand this. You're going to get some propaganda thrown at you that's going to say obesity is a biological disease that cannot be reversed. You're going to get that. Yeah. Just know, and they're going to they're going to say to you it's not lifestyle driven. Okay, false. I studied genetics, and I'm telling you that the genes have only changed two percent in ten thousand years. Obesity is not a biological problem; it's a lifestyle and environmental problem. So just know that. Then. Over the course of time, lead by example, parents, feed your kids and do with your kids what you know to eat and what you know to do. In other words, feed your kids food. If it's food that's it's an original package form the way it was created, it's food. If it was not like that, you know, I always make this joke. There was no donut trees in the Garden of Eden. Right. Uh -huh. So people get that idea. What the bottom line is, if it's in its real package form, eat it. Teach your kids to eat that. Teach your kids to get outside. Teach them to get out and get nature, to exercise, to get some rest. You do it too. Talk about these things around the dinner table. Don't just depend on the government or someone else to feed your kids because look at what's happening. Obesity being the fastest growing non-communicable disease in history. In America right now, we have about 40% of our children that are obese. It is not okay. This is the proverbial elephant in the room, David, and we need to start dealing with this because this is the greatest threat, I believe, to our world's health and population. So obesity, as you said, uh, the stats you just threw out, is that a combination of how much food people are eating versus what? Is it a, what, what's the balance of that? It's generally gonna be the what they're eating because okay. what makes a person hungry? Let's think about that from a, from a reasonable standpoint. I like this return to reason concept, so I'm going to hammer that one, right? Yeah, yeah. The idea behind that is when the body produces this feeling of hunger, it means the body is needing something, and it's giving you desire to go grab it. We believe that what you need is supplied from the ground, from the earth. So if the body's perpetually hungry, that would also tell you perhaps it's not getting what it needs. So if we consume a lot of uh, nutrient-absent foods, David, that would make sense with the processed foods that are high caloric, low energy, and low yeah. nutrient, as opposed to a lower caloric type of food with higher nutrient density. The more nutrient-dense you eat, the less hungry you will be. Yeah. So it's well more important to lean towards what one eats than how much one eats. Get away from the calorie formula because that's a, a messed up situation okay. to say the least. Gravitate towards, you know, parents, feed your kids like you would feed a tree. Give it the best fertilizer, the best water. You know, you wouldn't think of treating an animal like that. You wouldn't think of treating your plants like that because they won't grow and they won't live. Yeah, yeah. Treat your kids at least as good as you treat your animals and your plants. I mean, that's a, a, hey. a good way to look at it, but it is true. 
at the very least, <laughs> after yeah, your kids are doing injury, right? Hey, so with the food that you and your wife eat, are you guys adding supplements on top of what you eat? Is there different things you're, you're taking on top? And what, what kind of things would you take on a daily basis? Yeah, so you could eat a great healthy meal. Uh, you can eat a great healthy diet, and you can eat all organic and all that. But in today's world, you're still going to be absent certain nutrients because the soil has not been allowed to rest. Therefore, the degradation of the nutrient content of plants, whether you're all in North America, wherever you are, has changed substantially. So yeah. supplementation, therefore, becomes necessity, not just an option. Sure. We have observed that every human being, especially north of the equator and south, you know, you need your vitamin D, as in David. We assess that most people, 12 years of age and up, 5,000 international units per day is sufficient, probably more the more time you are in the dark and the less daylight we have. Yeah. Um, we don't get the transition of D from the UVB rays in the sun anymore because of the toxicity in our environment. So you can't sure. depend on the sun. Omega-3 fatty acids are always a necessity. We've checked people all around this world, and for the last decade, 100% of the people we've tested have been deficient. Omega-3 fatty acids are a necessity as well. We believe, over 12 again, three grams minimum to contain about a three-part to two-part EPA over DHA. And those are essential fatty acids within that. The, the terms people are looking for, EPA, is called eicosapentaenoic acid. DHA is docosahexaenoic acid. So yeah, yeah. you can see why I use EPA and DHA of for course, abbreviation. Yeah. <laughs> and then we also want to consider magnesium. Yeah. Magnesium is a well-known deficiency created by our environment. Uh, there's multiple forms. Uh, some of the best ones we use are like glycinate, malate, et cetera. Somewhere between about 300 milligrams and up to six or 700 milligrams is what a person needs. And then we believe a multivitamin is, is really beneficial. Yeah. Not that a person uh, per se needs it, but a qual quality multivitamin, multimineral is going to be helpful to supplement an already excellent diet. Yeah, no, that's great. Hey, Mark, would you tell me about your new book as well, The Garden of Eden? Tell me a bit yeah. about that. Love to yeah, it, we call it Surviving in the Garden of Eden. You know, funny, yeah. funny yeah. title. But we just did that to sort of paint a picture, um, David, of, of where people get off course. You know, look... Um, no matter what people believe, whether they believe in the creation, you know, the, the devil got Adam and Eve off or whatever, we all understand this. I mean, I believe that, but a lot of people need to understand that. Where does mankind suffer the most? With the food selections, their relationship they have with the ground, with the earth, with okay. this thing that we have that's created from dirt, this earth suit. And so we have this relationship that gets distorted, and there's not a person out there that wouldn't understand when you get emotionally broken, you go grab some comfort food, but it's not food at all. It's actually things that hurt you, things that are not food. It's almost like a drug, an opioid-like drug in our body that creates a temporary satisfaction. And with our physical health suffering, the first-line target to get us to suffer is going to be what we decide to put in this thing right here, hmm. which is our mouth. Yeah, yeah. And I use the mouth to illustrate like an open border. I mean, everybody understand the open border concept these days, yeah. right? If you don't check what's coming in and you don't pay attention to that, if you ain't, if the Canadian Border Patrol is not paying attention to what might be coming over from from America, you could have problems. Yeah. And I've traveled before. They did a good job. The mouth is the same way. And it's the first attack that we have to destroy our relationship with this thing call the physical body and it's the first area we begin to suffer yeah that's awesome mark hey tell our audience where if people want to support you or follow you or find out what you guys are doing how can they follow you what how can they connect with you well, i appreciate you asking they can go to sherwood.tv super easy and you can yeah, see what my sure. wife and i do and, you know we work with people everywhere and there's stuff and things and free blogs and free videos and connect with our tv stuff it's great yeah, that's awesome, Mark. Hey, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate it. We'll talk soon. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth, knowledge, and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking Become an Insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.